Welcome back to the Let's Talk Business podcast. I'm your host, James Price. Now, this is episode 19. And I'm excited to, to have as my guest, Chris Van Dyke. Chris is Managing Director of CVD Commercial Glass. It's a business based in St Mary's here in Western Sydney. And it's been going for about 17 years, if I'm not wrong. Chris, great to have you on board. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. no, it's really good. And we've uh, we just had a bit of a site visit, and you've taken us for a run through. Yep. Um, So CBD commercial glass. Yep. Windows, doors, manufacturing, installing. Yes. Yes. Pretty much. Commercial, residential, industrial. Yeah. Yep. Home made, Australian made. Australian made, made. proudly Australian made. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I guess at the top, right? Um, It's always hard to know what the first question is, but. How did you get into this game, Chris? Oh, geez. So as a kid, following my father, obviously. Yeah. My, my dad has been in the industry for a very long time. He had, had, a, had he? Yeah, yeah he had a, his own company in, uh, in the 80s called yeah. PCV. Yeah. 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 And um, I used to go to work with him when I was a kid. He made up a little jumper for me when I was about three or four years old. And <laughs> I had his company details on me. Yeah. Um, followed him when I was growing up as a teenager. I would go to school, in the school holidays, I'd go to work with him. Yeah, right. Um, and then it got to a point that in uh, year, <clears throat> year 11, I was doing a traineeship at, at Bradnams, a window manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. And I was just as fast as, as the guys that they employed. Yeah, right. So they put me on a traineeship and then the rest just took off from the there. The rest flowed from there. Yeah. Yeah. So do you ever reflect back and say, well, you know, it was kind of in my blood and I learned it from a young age, but was it the right thing to do? Well, I always wanted to, I always thought I want to get a, suit, a job as a suit. Air conditioned, high paying job in an office somewhere. Yeah. That was what I wanted. Um, I didn't know I was going to become an estimator. Yeah. And I think that was my turning point from going from installing, uh, manufacturing, installing, yeah. to then becoming an estimator at 19 and having my own business at the age of 21. Wow, so an estimator, like an estimator, I mean, we've got a lot of clients in the construction and, and sort of building industry and other industries yep. as well, and an estimator's role, it's like the treasury almost, right? Because, you know, you're, you're sussing out the dollars and cents and how they come and how they go and what makes it work and what doesn't, right? So at 19, you had experience at an estimator, that's amazing. Well, I had experience making and installing the only thing that I needed to learn was how do I use this computer program to input what I need to input yeah. to be able to work out the pricing. Yeah. So my dad's apprentice at the time brought me over to a company called Razorback. Yes. And I kind of learned on the job myself. Yeah. I would take plans home at the end of the day and, Dad, what do I do here? How do I make this? And, you know, not that he knew the program, but he knew the nuts and bolts and how to manufacture how to install it, what you can and what you can't do. So I was at the age of 19 explaining to architects in meetings that what they've drawn doesn't work. You can't physically make something like that. And you knew that because you'd done the manufacturing. You'd been involved in the installing, right? Yeah. But they didn't want to listen to me because I was only You're a only young, young pup, 19 right? pup. You what know? was you know? What do I know? Yeah. Um, and from there, it just continued on. Um, a good 12 months on using the program, I came very proficient. Yeah. And uh, another 12 months later, I started with my dad and yeah. we, we won a small project out in Campbelltown, a golf course. It was only about a $50,000 job at the time. Really? Yeah. And um, started with no money, no factory. Yeah, and we right. just rented a small space for $150 a fortnight and 50 grand turned into 150, turned into millions of dollars a year. So and how big was that space that you rented first up there? 65 square metres. Really? Yeah. And we've just had a look at your factory. How big is it now? 950 square metres. In 17 years, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And that's gone through a number of stages, I think, hasn't it? That's right. As you've, as you've grown through that period. That's right. So we originally stayed in the first factory for about a year. Then we moved from 65 to 195 square metres. Yeah. And we stayed there for about 12 years. And, and that was purely because 
Uh, my dad had, uh, you know, certain types of jobs that he wanted to do and he didn't want to do yeah. because he had the skills to do certain jobs. He knew what he was good at. Right? He knew what he was good at. Yeah. And he's like, no, I don't want to do these types of windows. We don't have the machines. We don't have this. You know, he didn't quite know all of that. Yeah. And I've... I dragged it on for quite some time staying with his idea yeah. till it was like, well, everybody's doing what we're doing now. So we need to change. Yeah. We need to start to do the things that you don't want to do. And he said, okay, we'll go and get it. Was it as easy as that or was that a hard process? Like did that take a lot of time oh, with, I, you, I, with your dad? How, how was that, right? Because often, you know, in family sort of businesses with, 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 you know, different generations of family involved, sometimes that process is quite torturous, right? Yeah. Like, what was it like? So I'd say I became a director at 21. So I think between 21 and 23, everything was okay. So what we were doing was working. Yes. Uh, we, we, we were capitalising on, on the market. But then at the age of sort of 24, 25... Yeah. Everybody were do was doing what we were doing. So yeah. it took me a good two years of talking to my dad, two, three years, four years, yeah. to then going, well, okay, let's... He could see the work was slowing down and yeah, we started yeah. then, instead of manufacturing, we started installing shower screens for somebody okay. because we ran out of work. Yeah. And that's kind of when he said, right, I trust you, go for it. Yeah, nice. And I did. And uh, we won a $550,000 project out at Penneth Anglican College. Really? And we then said, well, we've got to get a bigger factory. Did that project make the business at that time? Like, was that <sighs> a, or did it really stretch the hell out of your business? Uh, look, what I, was I, it, what was it like? I Take, think, look, it there. stretched me personally. How? I was scared. Yeah. Because we had to move. So we found this new factory of 350 uh. square metres. It was huge. Yeah. Um, what comes with that is more staff, more bills. I, I need to work more. What, what, you know, what is, else is going to come with that? Because it's now, you've got all this work. You needed the space, so you've got the space. Now you've got all the space. Now you need the people. Now how the hell are you going to get the work done? But Chris, excuse the French, but what gave you the balls to take that job on if you were scared, right? Because that, that's a... That's a pretty, pretty saucy job, oh, right? Look, I think it's got a. I think it comes down to my upbringing, right? Um, Does it? Yeah, I, I would say so. Like, grew up in Western Sydney. Like, we 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 fight for everything, and it was kind of like, all right, I'm gonna. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna sit still and die? And I keep saying this to my dad. We either stand still and you die, or you take the leap of faith and you work damn hard to succeed. And if you fail, you learn, but you don't stop. Yeah. Because we had gone through a couple of hard years as well in the early stages of business, yes. where, where companies had gone bust and we had lost money. Yeah. We never got paid. Yeah. But Dad and I still had that mentality. Well, you need to get up and go to work the next day. Yeah. Right. Money in the bank or no money in the bank, we're working. So yeah. sick, not sick, no days off, every day, five, six, seven days, you have to work, you go, because nobody's coming to save you. You've got to save yourself. You've got to do it yourself. Yeah, look, look, I was going to ask you, and you've kind of revealed a bit of it there, but you come across as a guy that's got a lot of self-confidence, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I can get that having sort of years of business experience. You're now in your late 30s, I think. Yeah. But, but what I'm intrigued about, and, you know, there's a bunch of bunch of young people watching this this podcast as well in their in their late teens and early 20s yeah you know what's the thing that drives you at that age to know that listen I can be an estimator here yeah no I can take over after my estimator I can take over and be a, a director of a business at that young age right yep. like I think you know um you must have, you know, well, maybe you've revealed it. You just need to have a go and keep going. Yeah. Um, uh, was, there, was there a point at which in the business journey that, that you become very self-confident with what you're doing? Or are you, or, or are you, still, are you still on a, 
on a knife's edge in that sense, right? Like how, how do you feel about your place in the world now, your business, what you're running? Are you, you know, is it, is it, are you self-confident with what you're doing or are there always challenges and struggles? Look, I, I think confident but not cocky is a, is a good saying to, to, to yeah. have because yeah. within business you've got your highs and your lows. Yeah, yeah. And you may feel confident something successful happens and you're now up here and the one thing that I have learned in the time that I've been in business, when you're on that high wave, just brace yourself because something's coming to knock you down yeah. and put you back on your ass. You're yeah. right? Why is that? Hey. But, <laughs> it teaches you something, and, and I was a strong believer the universe is teaching us something. Yeah. Um, in regards to confident in what I do, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely confident in my knowledge, in what I bring to the table and what my company produces and how we do it and the standards because I'm well trained in many different aspects of that. Yes. Going back to being scared when we sort of made that leap, I was scared, but it was, now I had my parents relying on me, you know, because my dad and I were together yeah. and mum was, you know, sort of coming into the business to just do accounts. So now it's not, well, you're on your own. It's, you've got somebody relying on you as well. Like I needed well, to turn up to work or we're not, he's not going to eat either, you know. Yeah, yeah. So there's quite a pressure on your shoulders, right? Yeah, I didn't take it as pressure. I just you, took it as, well. It's kind of a positive. I have to do this. This is what we need to do, you know. Yeah. And don't stop. Yeah, um, I love it. Yeah. No, so, but going back to positive in business, you have to be positive in what you do. Because if you're not, if I'm not positive in what I'm doing, how can I expect somebody to follow me? How can I expect somebody to trust me enough to spend their money with me, f to have my product? So I need to be, uh, you know... Uh, you need to show that positive. I need to be positive and confident and know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I, yeah. I guess I'm just lucky I've got a bit of a photographic memory when it comes to plans. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and people are amazed that I can rattle off standards and rattle off details on parts of the job without looking at something even though I haven't even physically been to the job. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So. Um, and also I think, you know, just reflecting on that, what I see working with a lot of different business owners is, you know, the really A-class successful ones, they know what they're good at, yep. right? They figured that out. Yeah. And, you know, some business owners, you know, never actually, you know, never actually are able to figure that out. Yeah. Right? They, they're still searching to know, what am I really good at here? Is it that or is it? And you know, and and uh, I think the minute you figure that out, you can you can build a force behind that, um, and and you know drive it forward. Yeah. You talked about your dad a bit. Yeah. And uh, I think you and your mum live in the bush now. Yeah, in Mudgee. Yeah, lovely. Um, what did you get for your dad? What did you learn from your dad, do you think? What was the, the single most important thing you learned that you, you still carry in the business today? Uh, was there anything that you would point to? Yeah, I think his hard work. My dad, both my parents came from Holland in the, in the 80s. Yes. So my dad had multiple trades when he first got here. Yes. Didn't speak a word of English. Really? And, yeah. uh, you know, was a painter, was a... Um, uh, in his window, became a window installer, and he just worked. Yeah. And it was just that drive. Yeah. You know that yeah. non-stop get up and, and go. But I, I must say, I think the the hard lessons I'd like to say with a European dad working with them, they're yelling at you and they're, yeah. you know, telling you to do it this way, and you're getting in trouble for it. And then we we had all our trials and tribulations on site together. Yeah. But I, I think, um, I think I, my dad's not just. My teacher is my best mate, and I, I, I always said that I'm extremely lucky that I can say at the end of his time that I was lucky enough to spend the most time with him in his life. Because you spend a lot of your time in, at, yeah, at yeah. work, don't you? Yeah, you do. Well, I've spent yeah. a lot of my time working with my dad, so I've been quite lucky. So. Yeah, that's kind of nice, eh? Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, if I talk to your mum, what would she say that you got from her? Oh, geez, probably uh, her control, 
you know, how, how she likes to control things. So she's quite precise. Yeah. Is so she? she? Yeah. She's, and organised? She's very organised. She likes to be controlling. She has to know what's going on. Yes. And if she doesn't know what's going on, she doesn't like it, she's going to find out what's going on. And is that like you? Yeah, well, obviously that's, yeah, that's, uh. that's a bit how I am in my business. So that's why I'm also very good at organising everything. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I would, I would probably say that. So does that, does that, und- that quality, um, does that underwrite the quality of the service offering and delivery? To a degree. What do you mean by that? Well, well, the 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 fact that you like controlling all the elements yep. and knowing what's going on. Yeah. Does that help to deliver a quality offering? It certainly does. Yeah. It yeah. does because um, we're all the team are well equipped and know exactly what's going on as well because obviously that's an open line of communication with myself and the staff. Yeah. If something happens on site, I already know about it and I'm able to then uh, provide that information to the builder. So it's a bit of being able to uh, back your staff up as well when things happen. Yeah. At the same token, things are organised in such a way so that they can do their job as efficiently as possible. Yeah, nice, nice. Now I want to come back to the team. Yep. But how about we step back a bit? You run a, a window and door manufacturing glass business, yes. commercial resi market, yep. high end resi, commercial, industrial, yep. public facilities, right? Yep. You're an Australian owned company, you manufacture and install. What, what's the, the market around you doing? What are the trends in your market that are affecting your business right now? Yeah. That, that, that you either respond to or choose to ignore, I guess. But I'm interested to know, what are the pressures outside your business that are affecting how you operate? I think the fact that um, the industry that we're in at the moment is not regulated and as much in New South Wales. No. Um, You know, there are certain companies that have accreditation and licensing, um, but there's no governing body that would actually do anything about these companies. Well, you've got the commissioner going to building and construction companies yes. and pinning them for their poor workmanship. Nobody's really looking at the window industry. And um, saying, you know, the standards aren't up to scratch. That's correct. There are no standards. Well, well, well there is standards, right? but are you following them? Yeah, is the question. Is the question. Yeah. And, and a lot of companies aren't. And at the moment, we're finding a lot of pressure from companies importing from overseas. Yeah. Um, you know, Australian-made product for a duplex lot we priced was about 90, 90,000. And uh, another company came in, brought all the window, and that was single glaze. So yeah. performance, single glaze, not double glazed. Yeah. And another company came in from China and delivered the windows double glazed. Performance Whoa. for fifty, really? So it was forty thousand dollars cheaper than what we could produce it here in Australia. And it was, a, and it was a better product in terms of the the heat exchange and the glass. Well, the double the glass in the product was better. Was the frame any better? That I can't tell you. They're, no. they're not no. an accredited company in Australia with any licensing or accreditation. Yeah. but they can bring the product in and have it installed. So, Chris, how does a company like yours compete with that? Like, how does that work? You need to, you need to, find, your, you need to find the ideal client that is looking for what you provide them. A lot of companies have tried going overseas and have been burnt and have had problems, yeah, you know, because yeah. companies that bring it in don't have the service capability to replace things quickly here yeah. or to service their product should something fail. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they just don't want to take the risk. So it's like picking something off the shelf, shoving it in the house or the building, and that's it. That's wash, right. Wash your hands of it. That's right. Where that's not what you're offering, is it? No, about. no. I'm offering the 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 service, the quality, um, and the, the the speediness of being able to produce these windows. If you get it from overseas, you're waiting 12 to 16 weeks. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you want to get it from us, we can give it to you three and four weeks. Yeah. You yeah. know, depending on the project. Um, but those dynamics are challenging, that pricing issue, isn't it? Definitely. Right. So it means 
puts a lot of pressure on a business like yours to think, well, what value am I adding the client here? Why is a client going to come to me? That's right. Versus someone that's peddling, you know, a product that's a product. I mean, it gives a window, I guess, yep. doesn't it? Yeah. So um, that's, that's also another reason why last year I started offering 24 months labour warranty on our installation. Yeah, okay. So I, I'm of the opinion that if my team is adequately trained, which they all are, and, and install the products to the way that I believe they need to be installed to manufacture specifications, but as well as going above and beyond doing certain other things that, that I do, yeah. um, why can't I warrant it for an extra 12 months? Yeah. So a normal company will only warrant the labour component for 12 months after installation. And not the materials. No, no, the materials are warranted, are meant to be warranted for five to ten years, depending okay. on, you know, the, the standards at the time. Yeah. Um, but the labour component on the installation is only warranted for 12 months. Right, right. So I've, I, on those particular luxury homes that we do, I have chucked in another 12 months in free warranty on the labour component. So, so I'm teasing you, right? But you've got mm-hmm. tickets on your staff, right? Because you're saying, my staff are that fucking good yep. that I'm prepared to put another year against them. Yep. Basically, that's yep. what you're saying, aren't yep. you? Yeah. But at the same token, there's been an issue on a job two, three years later where most other companies go, well, it's after the defects liability period. We don't want to have anything involved. We'll fix it, but we're charging it for it. Yeah. And I'll go and inspect the job, and if it's a fault, I'll replace it. Yeah. I'll rectify the issue at no charge. Yeah. So I see how you're defining yourself, right? And it, it's kind of interesting because we talked about regulation or, or the lack of it yeah. here in New South Wales. And I think you're sort of intimating to me that Listen, I, I don't mind regulation. I wouldn't mind it to see it in place. Is that right? I think it'd be great for the industry, and I've been advocating for it for, for quite some time now. And and why is that? Is it is it because it would mean that people that are a little bit unscrupulous around what they're delivering um, would find it harder to 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 feed themselves? Yeah. I think a lot of people would lose a lot of money mm-hmm. at the start, mm-hmm. uh, but I think in the end. Um, the clients and the industry will benefit because, uh, you know, in a trade, we, we have a trade in New South Wales called glaziers, okay, a glazing trade. Yes. And at TAFE, you go there for four years like every other yes. trade. There's only one TAFE in New South Wales. Lidcombe, is it? Lidcombe, TAFE. Lidcombe, yeah. Um, and the courses that they currently do also don't take into, um, at the moment, all the aspects in regards to aluminium windows and doors, frameless glass, installations. <coughs> they do do a lot now and they've come a long way and they're trying to develop that. Yeah. But to get that trade that is what we what we are doing, a lot of people don't have a trade yeah. and have just had on-site experience. I just listened to your talk about it. And, you know, I can't help thinking you're talking about a profession. Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Is that is that right? It is. Yeah. And yet it's a trade, right? And we tend to, I think in some worlds, it's a bit of a look down at trades. Yeah. Yep. But, but you're talking about it as a profession. But you're not just talking about it broadly. You, you know, you, you seem to be practising it. You know, yes. You, yeah. I think that's fascinating, right? So, so does that, how does that translate? If I was talking to one of your customers, and uh, you told us earlier about a job in DY, yeah, right, which uh, I think was a was a public building or a school. It or was a school, yeah, school, Private big school, job, right? Massive job, yeah. Yeah. So if I went to the customer, yes. the end customer, yep. and I said, "How was it dealing with Chris and his team? Yeah, what were they like? Yeah, what's the three things they would say to me?" Uh, they would say that the, the quality of workmanship is high. They would say that, um, that the team delivered the product on time. Yes. Um, and that they got a lot of information from myself or us in the office to assist them with decisions on that project. Yeah, right. So whether it be technical about acoustics, energy efficiency, installation methods, 
design on how the, the windows are designed because a lot of the time the architects do yeah. draw windows that look amazing. Yes. But they're actually not tested to manufacture. Like the way they've drawn it isn't as per manufacturer specifications. Yeah. And a lot of people will just make it as they've drawn it. Yeah. But they've actually gone outside of the manufacturer specifications. So what you've just talked about there is a lot more than just a window and a door. That's right. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I just think it's very interesting how you're positioning yourself, right? Um, uh, in the market, yep. a highly competitive market, yep. one that's not regulated. Yes, it's got some challenges. It's yes. got some pricing challenges from out overseas and what have you. But you're offering uh, quite an extended offering. Does the fact that your business model has manufacture as well as install does that help you versus others? deliver those three things that you just spoke about? It certainly does. Yeah, because you've got more, what, is it just more influence over a bigger part of the chain? Well, well the, the, yeah, well, the thing is that it's hard to get good window installers. It's, it's a dying, it's like a dying trade. Yeah. There's not that many new people coming through to do the trade. And a lot of companies are just doing supply only of windows because it's easy. They can make you whatever you want. Yes. Deliver it to you. The way you go. Then it's your problem. Yeah. So a lot of we, a lot of the time we are getting phone calls from people that are asking, "Do you also install?" Yeah. And because we do, they will then use us over somebody else. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. This is not a negative comment, but despite the strength of your offering. Given what's going on in the industry, in the broader construction sector, yep. right? Are you fighting a losing battle? Uh, look, if I was just, if I had this business and it was just about money and it, it wasn't something that I was passionate about yeah. and that I actually love what I do, you would probably say, do you know what, it is. Yeah. Or it's easier for me just to jump on the ship like everybody else and Go that way. Go that way. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's much more than that. Um, the company is CVD, which is my initials. C yeah, is yeah. Chris Van Dyke. Yeah. So I'm actually, I've got a lot of pride and passion about what I do. Yeah. Uh, but I also tell Yvonne, one of my estimators, um, my, my estimator that works closely with me, that we need to educate customers and architects and builders, yeah. one project at a time. So the more you educate other people out there, the more you then start to bring in a, a sense of quality and standards. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's extremely important. But it's the question, the question you ask me is, am I fighting a losing battle? Well, if the tough, what do they say? They say, when, the, when, when times get tough, the tough get going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the construction industry has faced many, many different challenges yeah. over the years. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I asked that question just to, just, you know, just to see your strength of resolve, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, again, I talked before about what are the attributes of an A-class business owner? Right? Yep. And from my experience, one of those is understanding their external market. Yes. What are the things impacting? And being able to not be a salmon and just flow with the stream, sometimes swim against the stream, but know what you're swimming against, right? And position yourself to maximise where you can from your strengths, right? And I think... You know, you've just told us a story of that, really. Um, you know, a lot of us in business don't take a lot of time to understand what are the what what are the drivers of the external market. You know, you know, geez, I'm just focused on my business day to day. I just got to keep it going, right? I got cash flow, I got a team, I got staff, I got orders, I got you know, you know, I've got debt to service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know. Uh, turn your turn your eye against what's going on around you, and at your peril, in my view, right? And I think it's I think it's fascinating because you've turned what 
uh, I mean, it's, we're not saying it's, it's, it's easy, but you, you've turned real challenges into opportunities, right? You have to pivot. Yeah, well, you do. And you have to say, well, hold on, regulation, it's not there, it might be coming, but it's not there right now. Well, we'll regulate ourselves because essentially what you're talking about is you, you've done that at each element of the chain and now you're selling that to your customer. Yeah. Right, that DY exactly. customer is, has recognised that. That's right. right. Um, and you would hope that that same customer is going to talk to someone down the road and say, hey, listen, if you, if you want a really good service and you want a solution that's a cut above, yeah. go to this guy. And that's what yeah. we're finding. Yeah. And we're talking about, um, you know, looking ahead of the market and seeing the, the influences from external markets and things like that. Prime example would have been uh, when COVID hit. Yeah. You know, um, it, it crippled the construction industry. Yeah. And I was actually quite lucky. I was doing a project in Griffith at the time, quite a large private school. Yeah. I lived in Cronulla. Some of my team were in St Mary's. Some of the team lived in Campbelltown. Both became overnight hotspots. Yeah. They yeah. weren't allowed to leave the LGA. Yeah. The gates were locked. The gates were locked. <laughs> we had hundreds of thousands of dollars of stock in the factory ready to go to, to, to Griffith. Yeah. That we weren't going to get paid for unless it was installed. Yeah. Picked up the phone, rang my dad, said, you're a mudgy. You're out of the LGA. Yeah. Get in your car. <laughs> I'm, I'll meet you at Griffith tomorrow because I'm driving to the factory from Cronulla now. Yeah. I'm picking up the truck and we're going to go and do the job there. So you just you just worked away. And we just went. Yeah. Um, we also found the price point at that time going through COVID got really tough. We pretty much had to drop our pants quite a lot just to win the work. Yes. So the whole idea through that period was at the start was just get the work in to keep the guys busy. Yeah. Just even if you're not making money, but you're ticking over, the guys are still employed, you're still ticking over. So we did that. So yeah. I made that decision straight away. Um, then before the prices of building materials and construction materials started to, to skyrocket, yeah. I actually brought my prices back up, okay? So that I was a step ahead of the game. So first I swallowed up the work that I needed to have to sustain me through that COVID period. Yeah, right. And then I brought my prices up because I knew that I couldn't sustain that and I had enough work to keep me busy. Yes. But I wasn't willing to take on more and more work, not making money because obviously that's a detriment of the company. Um, and I was lucky enough to be one step ahead when all the prices came up and all the other companies got severely burnt because they had won these jobs at, at, at no margin and prices went through the roof. And, and some of those companies are still getting burnt or going out the back door under. right now because they, yep. they haven't changed their pricing and they're, or, or they're locked in and the materials, you know, have just tanked a job that was otherwise going to be profitable. 100%. Yeah. So, I mean, that's very interesting in itself. What's given you that approach? Because it sounds like you've got a dynamic approach to looking at pricing, where you know, a lot of us business owners, we tend to set a price in our mind, and that's the price we take, right? And that's the margin. Um, is that that estimating experience coming out in uh, you? I would you probably say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, obviously you know what your overhead costs are and your running costs from your accountant. And, you know, I've got a really good software that I use like every other estimator in the yes. wind industry. Yeah. Um, but I, I certainly think that it comes down to a lot of experience. Yeah, but, it's, but you're looking at the fine details, are you? Yeah. of jobs and returns and margins and looking at one, what will the client find value, but two, where's value for you and how are you gonna how are you gonna manage that I guess. Of course. And yeah. and what's 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 the end goal? Long term. Yeah. I'm always a long I'm a long game player. Long game, I mean, what do you mean? How long? Well I, I, I didn't start the business to be rich tomorrow. You no. know, I, I started no. the business I, I I do what I do because I want to create a legacy in the industry on what we produce and what we make and who we are. And I don't necessarily just take on a job because I'm going to make five grand or 10 grand on a project. But what is that legacy, Chris? I mean, what, what you know, if I was at your grave, 
what would I be saying about you as I looked over your business? It, well, not in the grave, but you know, yeah. from a legacy perspective, you know, what 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 would they be saying? CBD, you know, it was a business that. What would they be? Well, you know? yeah, we 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 standing over my grave, not the business, because the business is going to be taken over by my son one day, probably when he's there born. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, certainly the the guys that are working for me will go. You know what? I learned a lot off that bloke. Yeah. He was a very fair bloke. He was really nice. You know, like, I'm not your normal boss. I've been where everybody else is in my business before. So my number one priority, family comes first, and that goes for my employees as well. If they've got something wrong with their family, that's number one. You, you also need to nurture your employees. Yeah. So you need yeah. to, to, to pay them correctly, look after them the right way, but also teach them. And I think they, a lot of the guys do look up to me because I've got that... A, a amount of knowledge and I'm not afraid to pass it on to them. So is that because they can see that you've been in the same trench that they've got to go in, so that, to speak? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And there's 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 things that they are doing and they are, you know, the things that certain guys and, and, and women in the company are, are coming up. So they're learning new jobs, learning new roles and they're, they're really excited about being able to do that. And because I've done from the ground up, they're essentially learning from me. Yeah, yeah. And they're asking me all these questions and they're amazed that I can just spit out yeah. industry standards like that and give them solutions to a problem that they might have that they're just learning about. How do you find that? How do you find dealing with your team like, and, and taking them through that learning process? Is it frustrating? Is it satisfying? Is it, is it all of that? What, it, what is it for you? How do you find it? Is it, is it a... Is it a is it a priority and, and, and joyous part of your, your role or is it a thing that just has to be done? Well, look, I, I, I do enjoy it. I don't think it's frustrating at all. No, um, no. I also, I think it's probably because of the mindset that I do have because when I became an estimator, even though technically I was um, like higher ranked, as you would call it, yes. than a factory worker, yeah, you know, or, yeah, yeah. Or, or the apprentice, I would never be like that. I was always same level. And, yeah. and even to today, even though I'm the boss, yeah. I don't think that I'm above any of my workers. Yeah. And I asked them, oh, do you mind doing this for me? I don't say, do this do or this do that. Yeah. So when we have a, a problem, you know, for instance, my factory manager, Jared, would come up to me and say, hey, I'm look, trying to do this, but, you know, we've got a problem here. We'd brainstorm together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd find a solution, and it's great. Yeah. Now, I think it's, I think they quite enjoy it as well because they've got somebody to, to bounce stuff back and forth with that actually yeah. knows what's going on. Um, yeah. and, I, and, and the team that I do have are, are all great. So. See, I mean, I think one of the, one of the key things of a good work culture is people surfacing and transparently talking about problems. Yes. And issues. That's you right. Know? Like there are many workplaces where it takes a lot to surface a problem. Yeah. Because there's a perception that the guys above, the girls above, don't want to hear about that problem. Yeah. They just want the solution or they want things solved. So, so I think it's really neat that you have a team that is prepared to brainstorm that stuff because, you know, it creates, from my experience, it creates great efficiency, mm -hmm. you know, because everyone's pulling it the same, the same way. That's right? correct. Right the way along. Yeah. And it's also important that if somebody does make a mistake that they're not afraid to speak up. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that we do have quite well is if I make a mistake, I'm the first one to put my hand up. Hey guys, I stuffed this, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Or, you know, my installers will ring me, hey Chris, we've damaged this, or you know, we broke this piece of glass, or I measured this wrong. And I always say, okay, how did you make that mistake? Yeah, yeah. You need to identify how you make that mistake to be able yeah. to know for next time so that you don't make that same mistake. And I've made plenty of mistakes. Doing yeah, what look, I, do as look well. I mean, I think mistakes are good. And I, I, it's almost like a mistake Admitting a mistake is like a form of ownership in my view. Yeah. Because you're saying, well, you know, I'm not just here employed to take a salary or a wage or whatever. Um, you know, 
I, I care more than that. Yep. Right. So to have a culture where your team is prepared to come out and say that, and even better if they're prepared to come out and say, well, I've, I've made this mistake and this is how I made it, and on reflection, I reckon we need to do X, Y, and Z to fix it. Well, you know, what better could you have, right? That's right. Yeah. And, they, they, you know, it's hard to get those people. It is. It is. I mean, I had one, 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 one of my workers in particular, I was talking to him for about two years before he came over and started working for me. Really? Because I'm the type of person that I don't want to force anybody to come. I'd like to talk to you, I'd offer you a job, we talk about it, yeah. but I want you to go away, I want you to think about it, I want you to sleep on it, and then I want you to come back and make a decision that you don't feel that you're rushed to make. Yeah. Because I'm about, I, I'm, I'm all about staff retainment. Yes. So I want to, if you're good, a uh, good work, I want to hold on to you. And I don't want to just employ people and see them come in one week and out the door the next. I want to, I'm trying to build a company that's a long-term company and I want to have people there that's also long-term. So at the start of each year, I sit down with everybody and I ask them, what do you want to achieve this year? Yeah. How can I help you accomplish your needs this is the staff you're talking about. They're my staff, yeah. How can you accomplish your needs? What, what do you want to accomplish personally this year? Okay, so sometimes they tell me because sometimes it's private, right? Yeah, yeah. But then what do you want to accomplish in our industry in CVD? And then I write everything down. Then I, I go back and I reflect on the information that they've presented yeah. and then I try to work out how can I best help them meet those needs because... I'm studying business management at TAFE. Yeah. People go to work for a few reasons. One's money, one's social, and one's for career advancement. They want to advance themselves. Yeah. And if you're not, you could, you could have somebody there that you're meeting the need of money. That's fine. Yeah. But other people, it's not just about money. They want, to, they want to climb that ladder. They want to do something else in the industry. So if you're not going to give that to them, they're going to go somewhere else and find it. Chris, I love that. I mean, you, you basically talk, I mean, how I take that, right, you, you're almost treating your staff, you know, like a really good client and saying, well, how am I going to add value to you, Mr. Client? Yeah. How am I going to add value to you, you know, Mr. Prized Employee? Yeah. Um, so, and you're getting under their bonnet and trying to, kind of work with them on their development, yep. whatever that might be. Um, yeah, I can see how that can be really powerful. I mean, every employee will, will deal with it differently, as you've sort of intimated. They all have different motivations. Of course. Um, that takes a lot of time and effort, yeah? Yeah. But, but you're saying you don't get frustrated. It's, it's, it's time well spent. Yeah, it is. Do I, I, I don't get frustrated about many things, to be honest. Are you patient, dude? Yeah, I would probably say I'm very calm, I'm very patient and very easy going. Where did that come from? I would probably have to say uh, when my daughter was born and she was in ICU for two and a half years. And, and that it, sort of put really things in perspective? Rocked, yeah, bro? Just, it rocked me. Yeah, yeah okay. life short, yeah. Wow. And, um, wow. you know, and even... Today, you know, I've got friends and their family and, you know, you, people are here one day, they're gone the next. Like, life is very short. It's precious. Yeah, it is precious. And there's always somebody worse off than you are. Yeah. And I think I learned that when my daughter was in ICU. I always thought, oh, you know, oh, it's so hard on us. It's, you know, it's hard on her. And, yeah. But at the end of the day, I've got to take her home. People don't come home. No, no. A lot of them... In ICU, they stay. So, I mean, I think the value that you, that you, that you put on your life yeah. and about what you do, I think that's very important. How old were you when your daughter was in ICU? Um, she, I would have been in, I would have been, she's turning 10 now, so I'm 38 this year. So I would have been 28, 29. That was a hard time, right? Yeah, it was a very hard time. Yeah, yeah. And was it hard running the business at the same time? Yeah, the business crashed. Yeah. I think um, at that point in time, I was, you know, after she was born, I was in hospital for three months. 
Oui. Yeah, it will yeah. staying going back and forth. Yeah. In that one year that, you know, in, in that first 12 months, I lost almost half a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. The business was at a loss. Yeah, it's uh, tough. Over yeah. half a million dollars. But I guess that shows your priorities, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think when she came home, it was like, right, up, got to go again. And in that next financial year, I had turned everything around where we made a profit coming yeah. from a significant loss. And that was the account just didn't know how I did it. And it was just get up at three o'clock in the morning. I have a crack. Go to work, come home late yeah. and work six, seven days a week. Yeah, but it sounds to me like you did that and, you know, and turned the business around in a positive way, but you also learnt some compassionate stuff about what's important along the way. Of course. Yeah. 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 Because I think, you know, it's easy for me to say, right, but we all have, you know, struggle events like that to different degrees. Yep. But, but not all of us take the learnings from those. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's tricky, yeah? I think life throws you a curveball sometimes. And like I said before, I, you know, I'm a strong believer that when I get presented with an issue or a problem or, you know, a, a major event, I, I don't stand there and go, why me anymore? You know, I think I, I did that when I was about 29. Was there a, yeah, was there a period where yeah, you were a bit of a victim in that I was sense? like, well, why me? It's so hard, you know, can't I get a break? Yeah. And, and, and I would probably say it was after my divorce. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're probably about four years ago, three years ago in my life, so I would have been sort of 34 to 35, yeah. Yeah. where instead of me saying... Why me? It was, okay, thanks for the lesson, universe. What are you teaching me? I'm going to go and find that lesson from that problem that you gave me so I can learn so I'll be better next time. Yeah, nice. And that's what sort of drove me. And, and, and how did you get over that threshold? Was it you putting pressure on yourself and thinking deeply about it? And or was it... Was it a mentor or someone else knocking your head and saying, listen, Chris, look yourself in the mirror and think about this? Like, how, how did that, you know? I think I think it was a lot of personal development yeah. within myself, uh, working on myself, yeah. um, and just having my my parents in the background, you know, doing that. I had I had some very close friends of mine as well as a support yeah. network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they didn't know the ins and outs of the business, no. but my parents did. Yeah. And, and at this stage, they were retired and yeah. mudgy or semi-retired. Yeah. And they were just telling them, just hang in there. It's going to be better. It's going to get better. Trust me. Yeah. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. It was all I kept getting told. And then I'd get a small break here and that would pick me up, you know, and then... Yeah. I have another problem and keep going. It's okay. It's going to be fine. And down the track, we just keep getting some little wins and little wins. And for some reason, we've always been lucky enough to get that little win here that, needed, that we needed to get over the line. Well, well, I get that. And there's a great message in what you've just said. I mean, the way I say that, which may not do it justice, but there's opportunity and struggle, right? Correct. And and you say you're lucky, but... Oh, it's not but, luck. But you position yourself... Exactly. And you were there and you didn't give up. Yeah. And, like, I get goosebumps thinking about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know you're very proud of that. Yeah. And, and I think... I think it's special, right? Yeah. And it's part of what you've told us today about some of your root values that drive you as a person and also how you perform and how the business performs as a result. Yeah. Um, and I can kind of, I've got the impression, um, and I hope our audience has as well, that you, those values are not just in you. You know, they're, they're in your team. That's right. Right, because you've talked about 
yep. how you treat your team and yep. your people. And you've also talked about how you educate your customers. Yeah. Right? And um, so I find that fascinating, right? I really do. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, I just want to change tact for a little bit. Um, and, you know, so, sorry, I get a bit emotional because, um, you know, I, I think that's pretty, a pretty important insight, right? I really do. Um, but climate change, weather, environment, yep. windows, doors, yep. you know, finishings for commercial properties, residential properties. Yep. I imagine you're in a bit of an interesting period, right? Because the stuff that you're manufacturing and selling contributes to heat and cold and, and, and you know, the way the environment affects our living. Yes. Yeah? So how do you, you know, are there opportunities in that or are there threats to your business in that? I think it's, look, I, I think if I wasn't doing it correctly, there'd be threats. Yeah. Um, the other thing that a lot of other companies haven't done is they haven't done the, the energy efficiency course called the AFR simulator training course. Right. That's provided by the um, Glass and Glazing Association. Yeah. I was lucky enough to do that a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's about a three day course. Yeah. Um, and that sort of teaches you how to model different windows with different types of glass to get certain performance ratings. Yeah. So I can actually model different types of glass in windows and tell you the performance on that particular window to ensure that it um, meets the standards and relevant requirements on that particular project. Yeah, nice. I think it's extremely, um, it's a positive side for us. And I think CVD as a company, we're a little bit ahead of the some not everybody, I won't yes. say everybody, yeah. but we're a little bit ahead of the pack. We're, we're standing at the front of the marathon, <laughs> but we're also sort of standing at, at, and we're going to be standing at the front at the end at the finish line. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, we're yeah. going to be first, but we're certainly also going to be there in that first lot of pack, in that peloton, as you like to call yeah, it, yeah. from the Tour de France, right? Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. in the peloton. We're at the front of the peloton. <laughs> love, I love that. Yeah. So, so are you getting clients and architects and builders on behalf of clients talk to you and say, listen, what's the most energy efficient window here? You know, how should I approach this? Are you starting to get that direct from? I'm, I've been getting it for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, more so now. Yeah. Um, first, probably about two years ago, I was actually having serious conversations with energy consultants. Yes. Because they are doing the performance testing on a job yeah. and telling companies like myself what type of windows and, and glass, or not type of windows and glass, but what, what performance rating we need to achieve. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. But that all came from them using an Excel spreadsheet with a calculator. Yeah. Um, and some of those figures are, are unachievable. Yeah. Um, so I've had to sort of go back and educate those those energy consultants on, look, we can do this, we can't do that. These are the figures for this. You need to modify, you know, whether it be your, your concrete slab, your flooring, your wall insulation, wow. put solar panels on. You need to reduce your window sizes to then get a higher, like a, a not so low performance because their rating was very low, which means high performance. Yeah, yeah. But it's also not realistically achievable. Yes, I understand. So we've had to educate them to do that. Uh, at the same token, architects are coming to me as well now when they're designing jobs and they're using that calculator and yeah. they're saying, hey, we're doing this, can you achieve that? And I'll go back and say, look, no, we can't, but for the most cost-effective way using readily available glass, double glaze, etc., performance, yeah. we can give you these ratings in this type of window. We can give you that rating in that type of window. Yeah, right which then allows them to um, specify that project with ratings that are achievable. Very interesting, isn't it? Mm. Because those same clients be talking to other companies with those challenges, and, and what you alluded to before is not everyone has done that course and is calibrated yes. to think about energy efficiency when they're selling windows and doors. That's right. Um, 
And if you think about, you know, the whole pressures around the environment, you know, the sort of move away from sort of gas and, and, and you know, changes in, you know, how people heat themselves and cool themselves, um, I would have thought the whole window door piece is a, is a big component of the overall piece. So, you know, playing in that space has got to be integral. Isn't it? Like yeah, it's only going to get more and more of an issue. Of right? course. Yeah. Well, they've got the new NCC that's going to be coming out, and that's all about the energy efficiency. And they want st seven star now, not four star or three yeah. star or five star. Yeah. Now everything, I think it was meant to be in October, but I think they've pushed that back now, the government, due to uh, the cost, the rising cost of living, interest rates, etc. They've pushed that back, I think, till about January, February next year. Yeah. But that means that any plans that come into council, the windows are required to be at a minimum double glazed. Yeah, wow. Well, it was a big step, eh? So that's a big step. For, for Australia. Of course. In Europe, I mean, double glazing was, you know, it's been around for... They're triple glazing over there. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a big step, yeah? Yeah, but, most certainly. But it sounds to me like CBD is uh, reasonably well positioned to take advantage of that, right? Of course. In, in terms of its clients and dealings. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we're working very closely with our supplier. So we've been using the aspect now for, I've been using the aspect now for over 21 years. Yeah. And they're one of the leading um, suppliers of aluminium window and door systems yes. to the Australian market. Yeah. They're also proudly Australian made. And they're also now doing uh, zero carbon extrusions Oh, they really? Yeah, so they're, they're actually right. investing money in, in, in lower carbon efficiencies, et cetera. But they're doing a lot of testing on energy compliance, um, ratings. So we, I work closely with their specifications team in New South Wales. So we're always one step ahead because to get the information that we need to know, we can get it quite readily available. It's very readily available to us. Yeah. And we're able to use that to help steer the clients or customers in the right direction and give them the right informed information. But I think that's, a, again, another key, right? Like a supplier is not just a supplier. They're a partner. They are. And, and you're using their value to help give value to your client. Yes. Right? It's not just a transactional relationship. No. You don't just put in an order and say, I need this much stock this month. It's much more than that. It's a collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they, the more, obviously, it, it's a sales driven yeah. initially, yeah. right? Of course. But when they see the good that we're doing with their product, they want more people like us, more people that aren't cutting corners, more people that are producing quality products. Yeah. Uh, because it only makes their product stand out even more. Yeah, yeah. No. I love your long-term focus, Chris. Um, I got one last question for you. Yep. Um, what sort of advice would you have for a early twenties guy or girl here in Australia wanting to go into business for themselves? It's a big question because you don't know their background and what have you, right? But if you reflect back on what you've learnt and what have you, you know, is there any sort of you know, bits of advice that you would say, listen, you need to think about this. Yeah, look, uh, the first thing I'd say is uh, um, you can't get the biscuit unless you're willing to risk it, right? So I'd encourage anybody who's thinking about going into business to work out what they want to do and what they're passionate about because there's yeah. no point in doing a business if you're not passionate about what you do. Yeah. Because when the tough times come, you'll, you'll want to close up shop. Yeah, you want to go. Yeah. You know, but if you're passionate about what you're doing, you won't give up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and don't give up and, and start. If, you, if you're thinking about starting a business, put a plan into action, work out who you're going to sell to, work out what you want to do, develop that, do, build up you know, uh, a little bit of a piggy bank to start or yeah. don't build up a piggy bank and start, and just start. The main yeah. thing is you have to start. <laughs> because if you don't start, you're not gonna be any further than and what you're doing. And you're not gonna know, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Chris, thank you very much for being my guest on Let's Talk Business. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, mate, I appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Wow, 
That was Chris Van Dyke, Managing Director of CVD Commercial Glass. St Mary's here in Western Sydney is where his headquarters are. And look, I had a ball. I really enjoyed that session and, and I hope you do too. Um, it's chock-a-block with personal values, business values, long-term focus, culture, you know, business acumen, and just having a crack and not giving up.